Hello everybody, welcome to the Wonky Angle, where I talk about electronic music, both new and old. And today I'm talking about the new album from 103 Point Never. Magic 103 Point Never. So of course I don't need to introduce Daniel Lopatin to my viewers on this channel. I've covered him twice before when I reviewed his soundtrack to Good Time and his Age Of album. Link to those videos in the description. But yeah, he's one of the most, if not the most important and influential electronic artist of the 2010s. Throughout the last decade, he put out mind-blowing project after mind-blowing project that would sound unlike anything that was around at the time. From the synth excursions of Returnal, to the vaporwave adjacent sample manipulation of Replica, to the absolutely freaking insane sound design of R Plus 7 and Garden of Delete, he was on such a ridiculous game-changing streak that we'd started looking to him to continue totally changing the game. He did it so many times already. Which might have been asking a bit much, because there's only so much one guy can pull that off. When we eventually got to his Age Of album in 2018, I think we kind of had to step back and realize maybe we've set our expectations unreasonably high for this guy. And mind you, that album was definitely very good and continued to show him pushing the boundaries of the genre. It certainly wasn't like any other project I've ever heard before or since. But he splintered his sound off in like five different directions, tried to tie everything under the concept of a live show that he was doing called Myriad, and it was a complete mess that I had no idea what to make of. I could get into most of the parts of the album individually, save for a few somewhat off-putting vocal performances from Lopatin himself, which even those weren't really that bad in retrospect, but these tracks did not coalesce together into a complete whole at all. I don't know how much seeing the live show would have cleared up what he was actually going for with this album, but without that context, it was just a head-scratcher more than anything. So it's been two years since that album. Lopatin did the score to Uncut Gems, which I covered in a Some Stuff I Missed video, and while working on that, he became friends with this guy called uh, Abel Tesfaye, uh, and even ended up co-producing a couple of tracks on that guy's subsequent album as The Weeknd, After Hours. That was a thing that happened. And that experience later even rubbed off on him while he was putting together his next proper album here. In the most direct possible way, not only does The Weeknd handle vocals on one track, No Nightmares, but he's also credited as an executive producer for this whole album. He and Lopatin apparently became close enough that Lopatin was like sending him demos to see what he thought, getting advice from him. Apparently The Weeknd was reminding him that he needed to make certain tracks weirder, cause like this is an OPN album, remember? Oh yeah, and there's also some appearances on this thing from uh, Caroline Polacek, a uh, rap verse from Nolan Barolin, and some vocals on one track from Arca. So uh, yeah, that's all cool. <laughs> Now, I've been letting this one sit for a while, figuring out how I feel on it. It's been a weird one to parse. Like, you know how on Age Of there were a few tracks where Lopatin made some turns into more mainstream pop adjacent material and sang himself? Well, that's nothing compared to this album, which is probably his most easily accessible and pop-friendly project to date. His vocals appear on quite a few more tracks than just the handful of moments on his last album. It's probably his least experimental studio album since probably the days of Rifts and Returnal, and least overtly weird since Replica. Now mind you, it is still a 103 Point Never album and, I, and couldn't have been made by anyone else, and it, it, it still very much has the same weird sound design and flares you'd want out of him. A lot of sounds and styles pulled from previous albums of his like R Plus 7 and Age Of. And nearly every vocal performance on the album is completely drenched in effects, so it's not like this is trying to be his bid for actual mainstream appeal or anything. It's still ostensibly a very abstract sounding ambient record with a few poppier moments. Mostly pretty easy on the ears. And it was that lack of overt weirdness on this album that made it like, kind of difficult to parse for a little bit. But I'll tell you what, I did really appreciate this project's new direction just by the merit that this is the project that most highlights how Daniel Lopatin is just a regular person. Right down to the album basically being self-titled. I don't remember if I read about this before and forgot it, but Lopatin first came up with his stage name, One of Tricks Point Never, from mishearing an AM radio station's call numbers. Boston's Magic 106.7. And now this album is directly inspired by his memories of said radio station. There are several interludes called Crosstalk, which take several modulated snippets from radio stations that sort of, I guess, follow Lopatin's headspace. 
I always thought the name One Trix Point Never was really strange and esoteric sounding and fitting for how strange and esoteric his music was. But the concept of this album is kind of aims to demystify that, I guess. It's a reminder that, oh yeah, Daniel Lopatin is not actually a, like a sound wizard from another dimension, as perhaps some of us might have been led to believe. He's a human being, just like all of us. This project feels a lot more down-to-earth and relatable than anything else of his, while still retaining a lot of the same appeal that much of his earlier stuff did. It may not be mind-blowing, but it's very much not trying to be. Or even trying not to be. <laughs> and I can get on board for that. I don't think the music suffered any as a result. This album got markedly better with every listen I gave it. May not have been sure where I stood on it at first, but I did really grow to love all of it in its own way. Any time I thought I had a least favorite pick, it would end up clicking with me the following listen and I would end it... <laughs> I kind of ran out of least favorite picks and ended up going with the opening interlude as a cop-out. <laughs> Though for what it's worth, even the crosstalk interludes, I do really like these as well. Like, the first one, I, it just mainly says, wake up, it's like a cool intro that isn't that notable, but the other ones feel like they're trying to say something more concrete, deliver some of Lopatin's own personality through its cut-ups of AM radio buffers. The second one touches on people changing as they grow up. The third one alludes to how much Lopatin likes background music. The fourth one makes a few snide comments on the nightmarish state of the country and is even a borderline audio ITP. They are as important to the album's identity as any of the regular tracks, and I do think the album would be worse off without them. As for the regular tracks, supposedly this project is separated into different suites that each represent a different time of day and a shift for radio scheduling. Like, first stretch is the drive time suite for the morning shift, second stretch is the midday suite, and presumably the third and fourth stretches are for evening and late night. Though I'll freely admit this particular aspect of the concept does not actually translate to the music itself. Uh, I feel like any of these tracks could fit with any time of day. The morning and midday stuff has the same general vibes as the late night stuff, but whatever, I won't complain when the music's still good. Going into individual tracks, the album does take a bit to really get going. The opener, Auto and Allo, is a mostly strange, shifting, abstract ambient cut with lots of strange, sparkling sounds coming and going, later paying off into a nice little vocal performance, presumably from Lopatin himself, saying, I don't have a place to go, as some little uh, playful synth string licks spilled under him. I should also mention, while I was put off by Lopatin's vocals on his previous album, and they are no less synthetic sounding here, drowning in effects and borderline anonymous on this album as well. But somehow I was able to get into his performances a lot more easily this time around. They do feel like they have more pathos and emotion behind them this time. But anyway, while Otto and Allo is mostly just like a warm-up as the album is slowly starting to take shape, it transitions pretty cleanly into Long Road Home, which also features the vocals of Caroline Polacek as just as covered in effects as Lopatin himself. Often, like, hard to distinguish between the two. And lots of plinking bells and cooing New Age synth choirs. It's a very nice and calming tune with just as much strange abstract flair as you'd want out of an OPN production. One of the best tracks on here, if still falling on the subtle side of his production. Well, pretty much all of this album is on the more subtle side of his production, but whatever. Getting into the midday suite, this stretch is notable for a few uh, 80s rock-inspired ballad-type tracks, like I Don't Love Me Anymore. That one initially turned me off because of whatever vocal effects Lopatin was putting on his voice made him sound like a total formless washed-out cacophony, and he was barely hitting notes at all. But I don't know, like the sunny pop rock instrumental ended up winning out for me in the end, just really puts me in a good mood, and those guitar solos and noisy distortion effects are pretty badass, and even the vocals did grow on me as well. I did eventually find them kinda endearing, as weird and off-kilter as they sounded. They're still less off-putting than uh, Lopatin with regular autotune on Babylon from his last album. Then after several undulating waves of plinking harpsichord synths, bassy washes, and synth flute riffs in Bow Echo, that was one of the best abstract cuts in the bunch, uh, we get the longest track, The Weather Channel, which has several different sections, mostly taken up by these plinking little ambient synth notes which sound like they're soundtracking your attempt to calibrate a Wii balance board or something. Though there's also sidetracks into more synth harpsichords or modulated vocal snippets, and there's that whole outro with the deep-voiced, half-rap, half-sung verse from Nolan Berolin, 
which maybe kind of came out of nowhere and sounds like a completely different track from the Plinky ambience it started with, but it was still pretty cool. Lots of vaporwave aesthetics going into this. And that transitions right into No Nightmares, an airy synth-pop power ballad type track with the chorus vocals handled by none other than The Weeknd. And even he's got a lot of effects to make his voice sound more synthetic like Lobatin's. He surprisingly fits right into this album's mix. The whole thing kind of reminds me of some of like those good down-tempo ballads from people like the Pet Shop Boys. At first I wasn't sure about this track because of how rudimentary and cliché the chord progression sounded. Not quite Paco Bell's canon, but kind of gave me the same vibe. But this was yet another big grower, just kind of stopped caring about the chord progression and the airiness and comfy atmosphere the track was creating won me over instead. Then we get into the third stretch, which starts quite stunningly with Tales from the Trash Stratum, Probably the overall best abstract cut, I think. There's like chopped up yelling vocal snippets, loads of plinking synth xylophones just falling over each other, individual piano and guitar notes, a few bursts of distorted noises or synth harpsichord flares, and even some cool like jungle field recordings in the background. Eventually building into this dramatic set of synth pads later on, it all sounds freaking incredible. The other two tracks in this stretch didn't impress me as much, but they were nice too. Uh, Answering Machine was a fun little collection of fast-paced synth arpeggios. Not much to it, being less than a minute, but certainly compelling enough in its short moments to not be marked as a Lee's favorite. It's still good. And then, Imago? Imago? <laughs> That one's not a huge favorite, but it's also a grower. After its intro of stuttering vocal samples saying imagine and listen, it's basically one repetitive synth lick that slowly changes and evolves over time, getting a little denser with each repetition, then getting more and more distorted and fuzzed out to a pretty extreme extent, really calling attention to those clipping artifacts as much as he can. I was kinda iffy on that, but then those synth cellos come in underneath them and create this really freaking solid emotive moment that makes it all worth it in the end, I think. Finally, we get to the late night stretch, which again isn't all that different from the stuff that preceded it, but this was the, probably the part of the album that took the longest to grow on me, but it definitely came around for me in the end and has some of my favorite moments in the whole album. In fact, the first track in this stretch, Lost But Never Alone, is probably my favorite track on here, period. Another 80s-inspired power ballad with more badass fake bass guitars and Lopatin's synthetic vocals bringing in his most emotive performance yet, and the cheesy halftime beat and blaring synth guitar solo care of Nate Boyce for the extra 80s nostalgia, because why not? Yeah, this one, this one kind of got me in the feels. Kind of got me in the feels. Oh yeah, and there's a random pause near the beginning where the whole thing just completely stops for a bit of dead air, which somehow didn't throw me off. But yeah, that th this track was freaking great. Next up, there's Shifting, featuring a whole bunch of whispered vocal interjections from Arca, mostly saying the words untethered and human, going over some synth arpeggios that repeat at the same pace, but like, slowly shift the boundaries of where each burst begins and ends. That was a nice little touch, and after some more Arca vocals, we hard cut into Wave Idea, another nice chill-out ambient moment with lots of synth flute licks, uh, fake ocean sound effects that are just white noise fading in and out, and twittering bird sound effects that are clearly just synth imitations again. As plainly artificial as everything is, there's still a lot of, you know, relaxing atmosphere created here. And finally, we close with one more ambient ballad, Nothing Special, which I initially felt lived up to its title and felt like kind of an underwhelming finish. But Lopatin's moaning vocals going over the dark and melancholy synth pads ended up making for a surprisingly emotional and powerful finish. Went from being one of my least favorites to one of my favorites. Yeah, this whole album has been a massive grower like that. I'm glad I spent as much time with it as I did. In one breath, I would not be surprised if a lot of people ended up being really let down by this album, given its tendency towards poppier flares, uh, the reliance on vocals and or how processed they are, the whole new age aesthetic of everything and like the synth imitations practically calling attention to how obviously fake they are. Not to mention for him, this is hardly uncharted territory. It's a more easily accessible look at some of his usual sounds we've heard plenty of times before, but not nearly as exciting or out of the box. It is a project that sort of makes me feel like OPN's creative peak might be behind him now, which isn't saying much because of how high that peak was. 
But by the same token, after seven or eight listens now, this project has stood out to me in his catalog by just how much emotional resonance I got out of it. First listen, I thought it was pretty good if kind of a plain sounding retread for him, but by listen six or seven, I was bordering on even tearing up on some of these moments. This is very much a project that Lopatin put his heart and soul into and feels very personal to him and his tastes. Like I said, it humanized him in a way that none of his other previous projects did, and every listen has just gotten progressively more and more investing, went from just being pretty good to freaking great, albeit for very different reasons from his other projects. Maybe he doesn't have the same, like, just wow factor and immediacy that other OPN albums do, but where it ended up for me in the end was definitely worth the extra time spent with it. Probably won't be for everyone, but I thought this was great. I'm overall feeling an 8.5 out of 10 on this. But of course, this is just my opinion. You can feel free to disagree with it, but I'd like to hear your thoughts, so leave the comments in the comment thing down there. Shout out to my Patreon supporters, they're awesome people. You want to add yourself that list or make me review something, link to my Patreon is in the description. But yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all for today. See you next time.